comes to us. Chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. It says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We have an additional passage this morning from Proverbs 28, verses 29, which says, God has no use for the prayers of the people who won't listen to him. The word of God for the people of God. Well, it's so good to see you guys this morning. Um, I, will, I must admit that after our all-church meeting last Sunday, I wondered what our attendance would look like. Last Sunday was a difficult time in the sense that we had, uh, we had a tough conversation to have about where we're at as a community, both financially and also from an energy and capacity standpoint. And so I, I wondered um, what our attendance would look like. I actually wondered what it would look like last week, too. But then on the other hand, I knew that Hot Meadow always seems to show up when it matters the most. And so it's so good to be with you this morning. I was thinking this week about what, to, what I could possibly say in the light of our uh, difficult meeting last week. What could make this right? What scripture, what song could make us feel better about the uncertainty and the anxiety and the fear about where we are at? And the truth is, of course, is there is no scripture. There is no song. There is nothing that can ease that anxiety or fear. I think it's common for people to want to, to look for something to do that, right? People want to numb pain in a lot of different ways. I mean, look at all the coping mechanisms out there. There's, of course, drugs and there's sex. And for some people like myself, it's the desire to have control and power. Sometimes there's a new job, a new spouse, or a new life that, can, that we use to cope. But the truth is that none of those things can truly make us whole. That oftentimes they're just idols that we look to that don't fulfill us. We'll come back to this in just a minute. So this morning, what I, what I have to offer <laughs> is a confession this morning um, from Proverbs. I was reading that verse in Proverbs this morning that God has no use for the prayers of the people that won't listen to him. And I admit I was a little bit convicted because oftentimes I might say all the prayers, but do I listen to what God is saying? And this verse says that if I don't, then God has no use for me or no use for all those prayers. So it is our job to listen to God, hence the discernment period that we're in. Listening to God can look like a lot of different things. God's voice can come to us through scripture. It can come to us through friends. It can come to us through music. Sometimes it comes to us through life circumstances and just the reality of where we are at, right? So as I go through this, this confession this morning, I do want to give credit to Peter Rawlins. He is a, an author and a speaker a number of years ago, Hot Meadow actually took a trip to hear him and Rob Bell. There was a, an event in Oakland. So a lot of this comes from his work. Um, he was on a podcast called The Bible for Normal People, which some of you might be familiar with. Um, and this is his idea of the Bible as sacred objects. So in that podcast, Peter Rollins talks about the tyranny of happiness, right, and how the tyranny of happiness is all around us. And this tyranny of happiness says... If you do X, Y, and Z, you'll be happy or satisfied or fulfilled. This comes in a lot of different forms, right? This comes in the form of money, in the, in the form of different jobs, in health and fitness. You know, think about all those influencers on Instagram that promise if you do these certain things, you'll lose weight and be your perfect self, right? So this tyranny of happiness is all around us. The deceit comes in, though, when you get what it is that you think you want, and then you're still not happy right? How often does that happen where you think, oh, if I just have X, Y, and Z, I'll be happy. And then you get it and you find yourself just as unfulfilled as before. There's stories about actors in Hollywood who finally get that breakthrough role and they say that they've never felt more empty, right? So that's the trick. This tyranny of happiness or these idols promise that they will fulfill you, but they don't. And he says that we are constantly caught in this struggle as human beings between who we are and who we want to be. And that tyranny of happiness says that if we get this thing, 
will be who we finally want to be, right? We are all striving for this happiness. Now, at this point, Rollins goes into um, talking a, a little bit about psychoanalysis, right, and how um, Oedipus Rex, if you're familiar, is a story about a mom and a dad and the id and the ego and the superego and how this superego is that voice of the tyranny of happiness. The superego is the thing that tells you you have to have this in order to be fulfilled. But then he rolls it into the story of the Garden of Eden and with Adam and Eve, right? And he talks about how, you know, Adam and Eve are in the garden, things are good, and then there's a prohibition. You're not allowed to eat from the tree, right? And then there's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And of course, I'm sure we're all familiar with this story, but Satan comes along, offers them the fruit, they take it and they eat. The thing is, is that that didn't make them happy, right? Satan promised that if you eat this fruit, you'll be fulfilled, right? They did eat it, and they ended up probably in a worse place than they started. So I think from the very beginning, Scripture tells us this is what it means to be human, this striving, this being caught in the in-between. And Scripture also shows us that getting the thing that you want doesn't fulfill you either, right? We are constantly caught between who we are and who we want to be. And getting the fruit won't make us happy. Now, Rollins then rolls us into the story of Jesus, too. So how does, how does, the, how does the Jesus narrative connect with this? Well, just like in the Garden of Eden, there's a prohibition, right, an area where you can't go, and then there's the thing that you want on the other side. Well, he said that the, the Jewish temple was set up in a very similar way. There's the common area, and then there's the Holy of Holies, where only the priest could go, and then there's the thing on the other side, in this case, God, right, that you can't quite get to. And so when Jesus cries out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The, the temple curtain rips, right? And he says that this is kind of dying to that idea of God, that even, that even, even Christianity can fall into this tyranny of happiness, right? Even Christianity can say, if you just do X, Y, and Z, you'll be happy. And this is a little bit harsh, but he says that anything that offers that fruit right, is satanic, right? Because in the garden, Satan was the one that offered that fruit, right? So he says in this way, uh, th this caught me off guard, but he says that even churches in that way can be satanic. If they are promised to offering you anything that fulfills, it's not God, right? So we have to die to this understanding, this idol even of Christianity. Even, even the Bible can be a sacred object in this way. He says that salvation proves to us that Christianity is not just another way to get happiness. It's the freedom from the pursuit of happiness, right? It's the freedom from that need to get that next thing in order to be complete. And that's the thing is that at its truest form, Christianity says that we don't have to do or be anything, that we are loved by the grace of God. He talks about how AA is a... Is probably the best example of what church should look like because you don't have to be or do anything to attend an AA meeting, right? And before you start the 12 steps, there's actually step zero, which says you, you don't have to, you're welcome as you are, but when you're ready to be honest with yourself and others, we can begin the healing process. So how does this happen? How, how is it that we're okay just as we are? The answer is grace. He says that it's the technology of theology, right? Rob Bell says that every single, that our lives begin with grace. Every single breath we take is a gift that we haven't earned, but that we've been given. It's all about grace. I must admit that I, I have some sacred objects in my own life. I have some idols, some things that I um, have been worshiping that have gotten in the way of listening to God. I believe that God speaks to us through our lives, and right now, one thing that God is telling me is to let go and do less, and I never listen, <laughs> and that's why, that's why I got convicted this week because, you know, God is saying, I'm telling you to let go, and you're just taking on more things. I have no use for your prayers, right? If you're not going to listen, why, why are you even praying? 
And I'm learning that, you know, I'll never be satisfied by doing more things, right? That I can never be satisfied except by being the beloved. I'll be honest that, uh, you know, on counsel, I think this is true for, for a couple of us, but I've been forced to explore my own relationship with God through this process, my own relationship to hot metal. And in some ways, I've made hot metal an idol, something that, I've been hanging on to with all of my my strength, right? I've been holding on to what it used to be and also what I want it to be, but that means that I've kind of missing what it is, you know? And in some ways, it's become a sacred object for me. Now, hot metal is special and unique, but in and of itself, it's not holy or sacred. It should not be worshipped. And the truth is, hot metal cannot make us complete. Only God can do that. What does make hot metal sacred and holy are the people that make it work and our desire to love God and love others with all that we are. So in this season of discernment, I just must admit that I'm being forced to let go of my own ideas about what hot metal is or what it should look like. But in doing this, the beauty is that you do make space for what God wants it to be of what you want it to be. So during this 60 days of discernment, I just want to extend an invitation to explore your own relationship with God and also to explore your own relationship with hot metal. One question that we always ask about it is, is this anything, right? And we believe so. People keep showing up. There is something that seems to be at work here. So we invite you to listen to what that might be. And as we listen to what that might be, we pray that God would make space for what he wants to be.